On behalf of Baron Miss Paisley and her family, I extend to their guests here in this iconic building and to all who are watching and listening to the service of thanksgiving for the life and for the ministry of the Right Honourable Lord Banside, Dr Ian R K Paisley, a very warm and sincere welcome. Since Lord Banside's passing, the family have appreciated the many expressions of affection and of support that they have received. Dr Paisley's life has cast its influential shadow over at least three generations, as a faithful preacher of God's word, as a people's politician, and as a distinguished leader in church and in state. Unfortunately, time does not permit to adequately cover these many facets of a life that was centred on a strong and uncompromising faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. His methodical reading of the Scriptures shaped his belief in the doctrines of grace and in the free offer of the Gospel. As a theologian, an historian and an author, Lord Banside has left a spiritual legacy that will continue to enrich the lives of many. Today people, nationally and internationally, will reflect upon their personal and precious memories of the time when they heard and they met the most gifted preacher of our generation. Life for many of us just does not seem the same without the visible and physical presence of one of God's favoured servants. During the service of thanksgiving, Dr. Paisley's family will pay tribute to a beloved husband, a dear father, brother-in-law, father-in-law, grandfather, and great-grandfather, and a cherished brother to Margaret and Harold. Regrettably, Harold is unable to join with us in the service to pay his own tribute. Many were the occasions when Dr. Paisley ministered comfort to the sorrowing in a manner that was characterised with compassion and with humility. A humility that was often detected in his preaching as he declared, Let my name perish, but let the name of the Lord Jesus Christ be glorified. The Psalm 100 is the embodiment of this timeless exhortation.
Please be seated. Let us pray. Our eternal God and loving Heavenly Father, we approach Thee in our Saviour's worthy and precious name, resting alone upon the finished work of the cross and the efficacy and the value of the Saviour's precious blood. We bring before Thee this memorial service, and we pray for Thy divine seal of favour and approval to rest upon it and upon all who will minister to us this day. We give Thee thanks for the life and faithful ministry of Thy servant Ian Paisley, both in the life of the Church of Jesus Christ and in the political life of this province. We give Thee thanks for his early conversion to Christ at his mother's knee and for a life dedicated to God's service. We thank Thee for his power in prayer and his power with men in preaching, through the multitude of souls that he led to Christ many of whom already have met him in the glory. We rejoice that Ian fought a good fight. He has finished the course. He has kept the faith. He has crossed the river, and the trumpets have sounded on the other side. We are pleased to bless and support his dear wife Eileen with us here today. We do thank thee for the evident support and comfort that thou hast afforded to her over these past sad days. We pray that you would bless her as she takes part in the service shortly. We pray for Ian's family that he loves so much. We pray for his dear children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. We pray for his brother Harold in Canada, for his sister Margaret, and for the wider family circle. But we pray especially for thy servant Kyle as he comes to open the word and preach the gospel of grace to us. We pray that he may know the infilling and anointing and help of the Spirit of God abiding upon him. Apply the word to needy hearts, lead sinners to the cross, grant them evangelical repentance and a saving faith in Jesus Christ, and prepare each one for that solemn day when we too shall die and face our great Redeemer and our great God. Continue with us now as we worship. We ask it in the Saviour's worthy and precious name. Amen. Four years ago, in the summer of 1950, Ian and I met and fell in love. A love that was deep and strong and continued to blossom throughout the 58 years of our marriage. Our marriage was not a dictatorship, but a partnership in which each other's viewpoint was valued. I believe that respect and patience, together with a good helping of humour, embraced within the bond of love that unites a husband and wife are essential and vital ingredients in a happy and successful marriage. Our happiness increased with the births of our three daughters and twin sons, and in the passage of time our joy intensified as one by one our grandchildren brightened our lives. And inside the past five and a half years, the addition of our two little great-grandsons further enhanced our joy. Now everyone knows my husband was well known and happily known as the big man, which he certainly was. He was a big man in every way, with a big heart and a liberal spirit. He had a father's heart, 
As parents, our hearts were filled to overflowing when our children one by one told us that they had put their trust in Christ. Home and family were of great importance to both of us. A time was set aside each day to join together in family worship, and from their earliest days, our children were introduced to the scriptures and taught the value of a one-to-one relationship with God, their Heavenly Father. They learned that prayer was not a pain, but a pleasure, and that God was their friend and not their foe. They also knew, as they commenced school and in time set up their own homes, that no matter how busy their dad or I were, we had always time for them. The bond established with each of our children in those early years has, con- has continued right through adult- adulthood and today. His father's heart reached far beyond his own family. He loved children of all ages and was very sympathetic to the difficulties confronting the young adults of today. These young people were included in our own family prayers, as were many missionaries and those in various positions of public service, and indeed all who asked for prayers were each brought before God. Summer holidays were a mixture of fun and games and history lessons. When we walked over fields and up mountains to vast monuments or graves or some uh, ancient battleground in various parts of the United Kingdom, Ian also had a pastor's heart. It was a heart that entered into the joys and sorrows that are part of all our lives. During the past few weeks, scores of people have related to me or my family how much Ian's presence and prayers had strengthened them in their sorrow. On many occasions, on board a flight or in airport terminals, people would stop him and ask for his prayer, either for them or for a loved one and he always took time to listen to them and pray for them. His pastor's heart included happy events, and on many occasions he calmed a nervous bride or a worried groom before entering the church to take their vows. It can truly be said of him that he wept with those that wept and rejoiced with those that rejoiced. Ian's pulpit was a sacred spot to him from which he delivered God's message of love and forgiveness to a worldwide audience. On the night of his farewell to his congregation, the first unforgettable and touching words he uttered were, This is the place I most love to be. He spent hours in prayer and preparation for every message he preached, and never entered his own pulpit or any other without being fully prepared. Not only so, Ian was an avid reader and a book collector, and wherever he went, so did a number of his books. His library contained an extensive and varied range of reading material, including cartons of books he accumulated during our holidays. Not only did he know books, but he had a retentive memory and a marvelous recollection of detail. This recall was not limited in his books or to his books or to his Bible but he remembered events and people that many others much younger than he had long forgotten. He was one of the happiest men on earth. He had an incredible zest for life and was happy in whatever he did, whether in the pulpit or in the three parliaments in which he served, and he rejoiced in the help he could give through these offices to many afflicted and persecuted people across the world, securing freedom for quite a number. You might also be interested to know that he is the only Member of Parliament from Northern Ireland who has ever had his portrait hung in the the Parliamentary Gallery in Westminster. His home was his castle, and he was at his happiest and most relaxed there. It is the place he would have chosen from which to enter his heavenly home, and God granted his request. On the morning of September 12, when surrounded by Rhonda, Cherith, Kyle and me, Sharon and Ian were delayed on their ways to home, but were able to say their farewells to him on the telephone. He slipped quietly and peacefully into the presence of the Good Shepherd, in whom he had put his trust as a little boy, and who had accompanied him through life, and eventually through the valley of the shadow, 
into his immediate presence. The peace and presence of the Saviour filled our hearts and permeated the whole room, leaving us with the feeling that we had walked with him right to the door of heaven and he had just stepped through. We knew that immediately he breathed his last breath on earth, his next breath was taken in heaven. Neither Ian nor I nor any of our family could ask for anything more. Thank you. It is a singular honour for myself, for my sisters, and on behalf of my sisters, Sharon, Rhonda and Cherith, and my twin brother Kyle, the good looking one, uh, to pay tribute to a wonderful and a very much loved father. When asked for an autograph, Dad would always follow his signature with the words Ephesians 6 verses 19 and 20. You see, the person looking for the autograph would automatically ask, what was that about? And it would give him the opportunity, it opened the door, if you like, to allow him to witness. And what an opportunity he got as a result of that. Because above all things, our dad was a gospel preacher. That's how he described himself. All his other achievements, yes, but he was a gospel preacher. That was the man. Upon entering the House of Lords, 
He had the motto text in Ephesians 6, 19 and 20, paraphrased on his bandside coat of arms, which you can see on the program in front of you. It has the words with bold proclamation. Dad could certainly speak out. I think there's four words you would have never heard, and that is, speak up, Ian Paisley. Dad was a man who made sure that he was heard, and he used that voice to speak up on behalf of others. He spoke plainly, and he was understood. John Major, when he was Prime Minister, had written to Dad asking for some answers to particular issues during the very early days of the peace process. Other politicians were clearly being very obtuse in the answers that they were given. The reply that Dad sent was clear. John Major's response, however, was an absolute gem. He wrote, I receive a lot of correspondence from colleagues, and it's not always clear what they are demanding or concerned about. With certainty, I can say this is not the case with you. I never need to ask my officials, what does Ian really mean? If Dad spoke clearly regarding political matters, then he spoke even more so regarding things spiritual. It was that plainness of speech which made Dad the orator he was. He didn't preach essays. He preached Christ crucified. His political speeches were bold proclamations. When Dad commenced an evangelistic campaign, all he needed was a field or a tent, a few wooden benches, a hymn sheet, and if one was was available, an accordion player. A friend of mine said, you know, when your dad began his political campaigning, all he needed was a lorry to stand on, a loud healer, a flag, and a flute band. And before he got to the end of any street, he had a rally. His gospel missions planted the seeds of just about every one of the Free Presbyterian congregations in existence today, both here and across the world. And we're very proud of that. And his political campaigns planted the seeds of a political party that under his leadership was to become the largest in this country. We're proud of that also. Today we celebrate and remember a life of one deservedly described as a colossus. But as a family, we know intimately his unique qualities. My brother and my sisters know from our home life he was a good man. We are all the benefactors of his love, his kindship, his friendship, and importantly, his example. Dad was a politician with a servant's heart. The milestones that make up his life are individually impressive. Collectively, they are historic. Many of you in this hall today will have heard Dad's voice echo off these walls in gospel campaigns or in political rallies. We remember with joy those bold proclamations. We remember those utterances and we are forever thankful that he did speak out for the gospel and he did speak up for this country. He served as a parliamentarian for 45 years, during which he became first minister of this wonderful country and a member of the House of Lords. Each of these is an achievement in its own right, worthy of celebration, collectively, They tell a story of a dedicated man of action whose every moment of time was redeemed in full. So compelled to preach about time, he installed a massive clock on the wall of his church proclaiming those three strong words, time is short. A man who values time makes time. And Dad was generous with his time. Dad may have been larger than life and was a real character, but he was always very approachable. 
He was open to all, and he loved people in all of their diversity. Children loved him. We see that. Adults looked up to him and were inspired by him. Colleagues wanted to be like him. He was inspirational. He was steadfast. He was consistent. Over the past five weeks since Dad passed away, we as a family have received countless letters and cards and messages from all over these islands and beyond, containing many, many beautiful memories of how our dad left his indelible mark on people's lives. Every one of those cards and those letters have been appreciated, cherished and welcomed. Each has carried a personal recollection of how dad's life made a mark on the sender. A handshake recalled, a prayer said for a poorly loved one, a humorous remark that brightened the day for someone, a visit when in hospital, a telephone call when in need, individual, evocative memories, all lovingly recorded. Almost every letter notes that Dad was a man of faith. One famed politician wrote in his letter to us, what defined him was his faith. I'm glad I knew him. As a family, can I say to you today, thank you. Thank you for sharing your happy memories of our daddy with us. You have been, we have been touched whilst reading them, and they have all been read by all of us. And when Dad walked into a room, he lit it up. Although it's not theologically correct, one of our uncles, who shall remain nameless, but he's actually over there, um, said if it were possible for anyone to bring more joy into heaven than already was there, Dad would be the man to do it. And although Dad was a public figure for all of our lives, his priority was always his family and his children and mum. He would never leave home without praying for us or sharing a verse from the Bible. Indeed, when we left home and set up our own families, he would telephone us every day and pray for us on the phone and chat to us about those important things. As each of us built our careers and our families uh, grew up, he would continually tell us he was praying for us in all of the endeavours that we were engaged in. His police drivers, who were with him for decades, knew before they could engage a gear in the car and drive away from home, that Dad would pray, that he would pray for them, he would pray for their families, and he would pray for the day ahead and what lay ahead of them. Once he said amen, it was then off at a whirlwind speed for another whirlwind day. Even in his last few weeks, he prayed often for his friends. He prayed for our country and the needs of our land. He prayed for unity in the church and for people he loved. His prayers were a conversation with a friend with whom today he is engaged in face-to-face conversation. We never once heard our dad say, I can't be bothered. He was not a complainer. Even in his last months of life, when he was too frail to do many things, if we said to him, how are you today, daddy? His answer inevitably would be, I'm great, how are you? Sharon, after dad's uh, death, wrote these words to mum. They actually contain the secret of dad's contentment. They're based on a beautiful framed text mum and dad were given as a wedding present and as a gift from mum's pastor. Let me read it to you. In times of health and vigour, we thank the Lord the giver. He faileth not. In times of trial, and of fear. We feel God's presence very near. He faileth not. In times on earth when friends would fail, then God his promise would unveil. He faileth not. In times of deepest sorrow, Christ assures us of a bright tomorrow. He faileth not. In time When from this world we go, eternally in heaven we'll know, he faileth not. Beloved Father, we salute you. 
Your children can, with love and truth, rise up this day and call you blessed. Let us all turn together to the Word of God as we find it in John's Gospel, chapter 10. I'm going to read from verse 1 through to 11. The Lord Jesus Christ is speaking. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way. The same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, 
but will flee from him. For they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out, and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come, that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Amen. May the Lord himself be pleased to bless the reading of his holy word for his name's sake. Amen. I have one prayer as I stand before you to speak this afternoon. It's a very simple prayer, as my father often uttered it for himself, that a double portion of the Spirit of grace might rest upon my shoulders. I think that that would not only make my job easier, but it would make it blessed, and that the Lord would speak as we concentrate now on the scriptures which we have just heard read to us. My father was a many-faceted character. His gifts and interests were numerous. His influence was broad and far-reaching. He touched all of our lives in one way or another, the lives of ordinary folk as well as the lives of those who occupy high office. I could not have been blessed with a more loving father or with a greater inspiration and example. My father was not just a talker, he was a man of action. In a very literal sense, he was a builder, because on more than one occasion, he rolled up his sleeves to help in the construction of places of worship. But also in his ministry, he was a builder. By faithful exposition of the scriptures, by a practical application of God's word, souls converted to Christ under his ministry not only became strong in faith, but balanced in their viewpoint and fully committed to the service of the Saviour. I can honestly say to you today that without his vision and creativity, the denomination which he led would never have been as effective as it was. And what is true of church, I believe is true also of the party that he helped to found. In a word, church and party reached their pinnacle at the point he left them. Ian Paisley laboured, and now other men have entered into his labours. Today, as you and I look back on his life with our own fond memories, we ask this question. What made him the man that he was? And I am sure that if he were present in this great hall today, he would answer that question by saying, By the grace of God, I am what I am. He would give the credit for any good he accomplished in life to the saving and sanctifying influence of the gospel. And your attention, of course, is drawn to this in his personal testimony, which is printed in your order of service. My father was taught the good news of the gospel by his father and mother. My grandfather, James Kyle Paisley, was an old-time, no-nonsense preacher We believe that God said what he meant and meant what he said. And my grandmother, Isabella Paisley, 
was in the same mould with a particular gifting in child evangelism. It was through her ministry that a very young Ian Paisley first came to trust in Jesus Christ. The date, 29th day of May 1932, on which day he responded to a message that she had preached on John 10 verse 11. Wonderful words from the lips of Christ, words of mercy, words of salvation, words of invitation. I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Mummy, he said, I don't want to be a lost sheep. Can you tell me how I can be a saved sheep? And when he was just six years old, he first opened his heart to the Lord Jesus. Needless to say, he never looked back. You know, the truth that saved him, Christ laying down his life, his taking the place and punishment due to the disobedient, was later to become the soul and the secret of his own fruitful gospel ministry. Having been converted to Christ at a tender age, my father had his whole life of him to ser- ahead of him to serve God. But he could never have known in those days what the good Lord was going to make of him. Nor do you and I know what God will do with us if today we heed the call of the gospel and surrender ourselves and our lives to him. You see, the call of the good shepherd is bound to be good because John 10 verse 3 tells us that he calleth his own sheep by name. The love of God is a wonderful thing. It so singles out a man that he is sure in his heart and conscience that the Almighty has a deep personal interest in his eternal well-being. And that's the truth I would like to get across to you today. On an individual basis, on a personal basis, God Almighty has a deep personal interest and longing for the best for you. In fact, in Jesus Christ, he's already supplied the best for your taking. And so I believe today that it is the wisest thing that you and I respond to the love of God and the call of the gospel immediately upon feeling it or hearing it. The sooner a man comes to Christ, the sooner he knows the joy of sins forgiven. So why not heed the call of the gospel today? Why not remember the Bible exhortation? Why not think well on these words? Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Not only is the call of the good shepherd good, the compassion of the good shepherd is good. The compassionate Christ not only gives his life for us, he actually gives life to us by rising again. One of the last verses in our reading runs like this. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am glad to tell you this afternoon, as if you didn't know, that my father had that abundant life. And abundant life didn't make Ian Paisley dull. It made him shine. That's what the life of God in the soul is all about. It doesn't make a man dull. It makes him bright. It makes him shine. And this brightness of spiritual life was apparent in the joy that he had and the contentment which was his even in the darkest times. This abundant life shone through in my father's prayers and preaching and in his religion generally. And in my own personal experience, I have never known anyone who loved the Lord Jesus with such zeal and such longing as he did. I watched his life and observed that the abundant life he had received in Christ made him deplore what he would call dead orthodoxy. My father could never understand half-heartedness in spiritual things, coldness or indifference towards Christ. In fact, he used to say of those that were inclined that way, he said, you see, those people, they have only enough religion to make them miserable. Abundant life made Ian Paisley firm in his convictions, and it made him forthright in his declarations. And it wasn't just a gift which he sought for himself. This vitality was something which I believe he sought to encourage in others. And that is illustrated in his little book on public speaking. He wrote the following words in that book. He said, If you have nothing worthwhile to say, then shut up. <laughs> if you have something worthwhile to say, then speak up. 
Folks, today abundant life is something that you and I should crave. And I know today that my Saviour loves you enough to give you that life upon the asking. Why not ask Christ for life? Why not choose life today? Because it's a life that is more abundant. Ian Paisley learned in life that the company of the Good Shepherd is good. You see, the shepherd doesn't leave his sheep to find their own way to green pastures. He takes them there himself and stays with them all the way. John 10 verse 3 says, He calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. What a wonderful, simple picture indeed of the faithfulness of Jesus. He had his fair weather friends, as we all do in life. People that pat you on the back when things are going well and say, Yes, I'm behind you, I'm behind you. But just when you need them most, of course, they're so far behind that you can't see them. Jesus Christ is not a fair weather friend. And it is therefore in the interest of all of us that we keep company with him. Because when the dark days come, he brightens up the worst of them. One of my father's darkest times was during his first imprisonment, but I remember him saying this. When the door of the prison cell was slammed shut, I was left alone. And yet I find myself crying, not tears of misery, but tears of joy, because the presence of Jesus was so palpable, so real to me even in that place. For this reason, the following hymn became one of his prison anthems. What though clouds are hovering o'er me, and I seem to walk alone, longing mid my cares and crosses for the joys that now are flown. If I've Jesus, Jesus only, then my sky will have a gem. He's the sun of brightest splendor and the star of Bethlehem. Again, the care of the good shepherd is good. Not only does he put forth his own sheep, John 10 verse 4 says that he goeth before them. And going ahead of his sheep, the shepherd sees any danger in advance of them and deals with it accordingly. So the Lord Jesus goes into life for the Christian every day, ordering his circumstances so that he gets to where he is meant to be regardless of his enemies. Way back in July 1981, I travelled with my father to the BBC in Belfast where he was due for an interview. During our time there, his police driver had opportunity to change from using the vehicle that he was using to travelling home in an armoured car. It proved a providential move because on route home a would-be assassin made an attempt on his life, narrowly missing the moving target. I think back on that day very often. Because had the change of vehicle not been moved, mo- made, the longer car would undoubtedly have been struck. And who knows what the outcome of it all would have been. And yet my father survived. And as you know well, in his final years, lived to play a major part in securing an honourable peace for this province. Ian Paisley got to where he was supposed to be because, not because there was anything special about him, but because the Good Shepherd went before him. And it is the wisest thing, therefore, for us not to run ahead of Christ, but let him lead and trust each day to him. The consolation of the Good Shepherd is good. He says in John 10, verse 28, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Now, I think if Dad was on the translation committee of the Bible... He probably would have thrown in a few more nevers here. He probably would have said something like this. If I had the voice, I would do it. He probably would have said, They shall never, 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 never perish. So sure he was of the promise of God, because really that's the only thing that we can be sure of. Amidst all the vicissitudes of ordinary life, the changing circumstances in this mad world in which we live today, thank God there is one thing that's sure the love of God, and the promise of Christ in the Bible. No enemy can extinguish eternal life. The man that has it upon believing in Jesus will carry it beyond the grave. Perils amongst false brethren cannot undo God's work of grace. The true Christian will retain his integrity, and the good shepherd will see him safely home. As the psalmist writes, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
I want to finish briefly with a word about copying the Good Shepherd. My father sought to emulate the Good Shepherd in his life as a husband, as a pastor, as a father, and as a leader. He discharged his many duties in the spirit of the gospel because he was certain that the love of God is a model as well as a mercy. He cared deeply for all who were under his care, regardless of their political or religious affiliation, but he cared especially for his family, who I can tell you today he never neglected, despite enormous responsibilities in other areas. Really, this is the best that human shepherds can do, to pattern their lives after the Good Shepherd and to be faithful representatives of Christ at home and in the community. My father's greatest passion was to carry the lost sheep to his Good Shepherd. We have heard about him today, read about him today, heard him uplifted in the singing of Psalm 23, and the call of this wonderful Saviour is echoed in the words of that wonderful hymn, I hear thy welcome voice that calls me, Lord, to thee. That voice that welcomed Ian Paisley 82 years ago as a child is the same voice that welcomed him a few weeks ago into the eternal safety of heaven. He made sure that I knew the Good Shepherd. He made sure our friend here, John Douglas, met him. And I dare say, as I look along various rows of his friends today, there would be one, two, three, perhaps more, who he introduced to his Saviour. His desire, above all things, would be that you who are here today, who are lost sheep, would meet the Good Shepherd who giveth his life for the sheep. That will bring you unspeakable joy, and it will bring the Saviour unspeakable joy. In the words of an old hymn, But all through the mountains, thunder riven, and up from the rocky steep, there rose a cry to the gate of heaven, Rejoice, I have found my sheep. And the angels echoed around the throne, Rejoice, for the Lord brings back his own. May he do it today in many lives. For Christ's sake. Could I invite the guests to now stand and observe a minute's silence, please? When I've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, I've no less time to sing a spring than when I first begun. <laughs> 